My name is uh, Katrine Bindesbølholm Johansen, um, and I'm an anthropologist and I'm employed at the research center at the national, uh, Danish national organization Live Without Violence. And I'm uh, presenting, um, giving a presentation on my PhD work for the next 20 minutes. Uh, it's a PhD that I defended in 2019. And I entitled the presentation um, a Debunking a Danish Value Narrative, uh, a Strategy to Prevent Sexual Violence. I'll begin by giving you an introduction to really what got me interested in doing this project. Then I'll move on to describe the methods and also the theoretical framework that I used in my doctoral research. Then I present to you the key finding one from the research, uh, really what's centering about that young people experience and that reproduce also gender values and perceptions and norms related to sexual activity that may be conducive to sexual violence. Then I'll move on to talk about key finding two, uh, how mechanisms that may enable sexual violence also depend really on our emotional reason and our needs and vulnerabilities as sexual social beings. And uh, and by the end of the presentation, I'll be pointing at some implications that I find that these findings might have for primary prevention of sexual violence. But first, what got me interested in doing this research was that there's this relationship between perceptions and experiences in the sexual domain. And there is a perception in Denmark uh, that Denmark, along with other Nordic countries, is a pioneering region when it comes to gender equality, trust and sexual broad-mindedness as these key three values. At the same time, we have national uh, prevalence studies that continue to show that girls and women experience sexual violence disproportionately to boys and men. And it kind of illustrates this inconsistency between a national value ideal and a reality of experiences at the same time. And this is what some researchers have already uh, called uh, a Nordic paradox. And this was really what, what uh, I wanted to dig into in, in my PhD. So the overall purpose of of my research was firstly to explore how young people in Denmark make sense of different forms of sexual violence. And secondly, uh, that what sexual violence experiences they might have. And finally, also the social conditions that enable these experiences to take place. And the project that I did was a qualitative explorative study. I have the background in anthropology and I was particularly interested in kind of exploring how and also understanding how phenomena in relation uh, to sexual violence kind of unfold in the social context. So in uh, 2015 I did uh, field work at two upper secondary schools a vocational training school, a commercial upper secondary school and a youth centre. Uh, and I really did this field work to get to know how gender, sexuality and sexual violence um, plays out in young people's everyday life. I also did focus group interviews with the young people. Uh, altogether, 76 young people participated and then I did individual interviews with 14 young people about sexuality, uh, sex, and also unwanted sexual experience that I kind of conceptualize as sexual violence in this project. And I should say that my, my work has centered on the heterosexual context, so I don't have any, any uh, experiences from young people with same-sex experiences. The circle on the right side that you see in the slide um, it kind of includes all the different kinds of sexual violence experiences that the young people they talk to me about, um, and also some of the some of the young women who had personal experiences and some young men too, but also young people who knew experiences from friends. 
In my work, I combine two theoretical frameworks to kind of make sense what conditions young people's perceptions and also experiences of phenomena that I conceptualize as sexual violence. One framework was practice theory, and I argue that young people's perceptions and actions are informed by a symbolic order of values, meanings and norms uh, related to gender and sexuality. And this symbolic order has throughout history continued to place what's associated with masculinity above what's associated with femininity. But I also understood and saw that young people resist these values, meanings and norms really on an everyday basis. So to understand this resistant, resistance and what it was about, I found inspiration in sociologist Andrew Sayer's work on lay normativity. And Sayer understands uh, humans as essential social beings. And because we have needs, uh, we are vulnerable uh, to harm from other people. And this vulnerability, it really gives us an evaluative relation to things that matter to us, such as our well-being and our dignity. And in my thesis, I tried to combine, combine these two theoretical frameworks. And now I'll turn to the first key finding, and this is that young people experience and reproduce standard values, perceptions and norms related to heterosexual activity that are conducive to sexual violence and that also challenges our national value narrative in Denmark. So the values that I found the young people were really preoccupied with in relation to gender and sexuality can be summed up in this metaphor that surfaced across school context when I did field work. And one of the boys explained it like this. Um, it's a lock that can be lock unlocked by all keys. That's a bad lock, but a key that can be unlocked by all locks, that's a super key. And then the boys in the focus group, they laugh and they snap their, their fingers in, in recognition of, of this metaphor. So the metaphor illustrates really a symbolic division between girls' and boys' genitals and gendered bodies, and also really sexual activity. So the lock key metaphor, it essentially explicates the symbolic value order that may work as a structural inequality for girls and boys agency when it comes to the sexual domain. And it kind of underlines also how sexual activity is related to a gendered value order where girls may be seen as slots or has the potential to be seen as slots and boys may be starts or, or at least has the potential to be recognized as starts depending on their sexual activity. And this informs uh, both perceptions among the young people, but also norms about uh, sexual activity. And it has real effects on how girls and boys, they, they may navigate in terms of exploring their sexuality in their everyday life. And it kind of also really illustrates um, uh, uh, values um, that are contrasting uh, or challenging to this value um, or narrative about uh, a, a gender equality and sexual broad-mindedness. So if we look at the key metaphor and what it means for boys, it shapes perceptions and norms for sexual activity that may be conducive for sexual violence. And this has to do with the social expectations that uh, they produce among young people. And with that, also the social vulnerability that kind of arises when you don't live up to these social expectations that the metaphor produces. And these expectations can be summed up in three bullets. Boys can be expected to practice sexual opportunism, mean, meaning really taking the chance to have sex. They can also be expected to gain respect from sex, from having sex. And that kind of leaves them vulnerable to when a sexual rejection re arises and it, it makes it humiliating for them to really accept this. And finally, boys can be expected to show homosocial solidarity, so solidarity. What I wanted to say was solidarity. And it leaves uh, moral policing difficult when friends act 
sexually pushy or uh, even exploitative. If we look for at the girls, what, it, what this metaphor really means for the girls, it kind of leaves them socially vulnerable in different ways than boys. And it also potentially vulnerable to sexual violence. And this really has to do with the somewhat conflicting expectations related to how girls should act in the sexual domain. And it can be summed up in the following three bullets on the slide. Uh, girls are expected to be both vigilant and liberal about sexual activity, and it kind of affects their own sense of sexual freedom because they may feel that they have to navigate after an undefined ideal about sexual broad-mindedness on one side and then on the other side not being slutty. Girls are also expected to preserve dignity, to be girlfriend material, uh, what, what some of the girls explained. And they are also expected to avoid this slut label to be met re with respect in, in, for instance, a sexual encounter. So the symbolic value order also underpinned uh, a central perception related to a sexual encounter, which may be conducive to sexual violence. And this was really the what I've called uh, the gendered miscommunication perception. And this perception could be employed by young people to make sense of, of uh, instances of sexual violence without really blaming the boy who was often uh, the perpetrator. And this miscommunication perception exi exists. Um, it's about uh, some boys being pushy in relation to sexual activity and um, in order to avoid misunderstandings in sexual encounters, girls are then expected to make these very outright refusals, such as saying no really loudly or pushing the boy away. And these expectations about refusals are really far from how we would communicate or at least expect to communicate these normative ways of, of refusing in our everyday lives. So the miscommunication perception it rests on ideas about boys having this uncontrollable sex drive, making it difficult for them, or at least some of them, to understand normative refusals. At the same time, um, the perception is really challenged by experiences where normative refusals have been met with respect. And this kind of leads me to another finding in my material, uh, which is that the understanding that um, that the girls, uh, that the way girls are, are being met, um, uh, also when it comes to sexual refusals, may really depend on their social status. And this is exemplified by the excerpt from girls talking about this this uh, hierarchization they may experience. Um, I'll just read the quote here. There are three categories for girls. There are Crit, which is a good looking girl, then Crane, which is an ugly girl, but then uh, who would you would still like to, to have sex with. And then there is a Tank, which is just an ugly girl. So this quote, uh, or excerpt really from a focus group discussion, it kind of illustrates that while the miscommunication perception kind of may divert attention from boys' lack of respect of refusals. The hierarchization also highlights how girls' social status may leave them more vulnerable to sexual violence. And with these gendered perceptions and norms in mind, I just move on to finding two. Finding one, as I just presented, is central in terms of producing a context that may be conducive to sexual violence. Yet young people also resist and challenge these perceptions in, on an everyday basis. And the resistance to these gendered perceptions and norms means that despite being conducive to sexual violence, they do not determine young people's agency. Young people's perceptions and experiences in the sexual domain are also being informed by emotional reason. And this is our emotional reason is our evaluative relation to what we care about, such as our own and others' dignity, needs and well-being. And this means that 
when and with whom sexual violence may occur also depends on young people's emotional reason and their capabilities and vulnerabilities as such on social beings. So although young people may be capable of sensing and also caring for other people's uh, other young people's uh, dignity, needs and vulnerabilities in a sexual encounter, their inclination to do so also depends on their ethical dispositions to act. And their ethical dispositions to act can really be shaped by three things. Uh, as I saw in my material, that could be the opportunity for social recognition, and this was when you're a part of a group where sexual activities are important to one's status. It could also be shaped by a lack of care and respect for the other person. This is when caring for one's needs kind of overrules the other person's need that you that you are with in this sexual encounter. And then the, the third kind of uh, circumstance was the opportunity really for sexual pleasure. That's when you take the opportunity to fulfill your own sexual pleasure uh, at the expense of the other person's will. And the interplay between these Free circumstances are creating kind of creating the mechanisms that enable sexual violence to take place. So the perceptions and norms around particularly masculinity, sexual and male sexuality makes sexual experiences or the lack of them a source of either recognition or humiliation for some young men. So the ethical dispositions to act are therefore not just shaped by gendered perceptions and norms, they're also shaped by basic human needs for respect and recognitions, which is vital for our sense of dignity. However, what conditions our way to respect and recognition may be gendered when it comes to the sexual domain. So to sum up, young people experience reproduce Res and resist gendered values, perceptions and norms in the sexual domain. Young people have emotional reason enabling them to evaluate how sexual experiences may affect their own and their partner's sense of well-being. And young people experience that their sense of dignity may depend on respect and recognition from others, which may be shaped by gendered perceptions and norms in the sexual domain. And finally, in relation to policy, I think that these findings from this project can contribute to an understanding of how different forms of sexual violence may be enabled by the same perceptions and norms related to gender and sexuality. And how also how we cannot talk about prevention of sexual violence without addressing these gender power dynamics. And I also hope that this, my work here, gives an understanding of the different and conflicting values that are at play in, in the sexual domain of young people's lives. In relation to practice, I hope that this thesis will substantiate how young people um, are evaluative, sensual, social beings with emotional reason, and they're able to reflect on as well as challenge perceptions and norms on the basis of how they impact their own and also others' well-being. And I really hope that the findings can, can be used to sort of support sexual education projects that focus on shaping ethical dispositions to care for others' needs, desires and vulnerabilities in the sexual domain. Finally, I also hope that my work can inspire critical normativity processes. And what I mean by this is really to create the space where young people are given the opportunity to both reflect on how values, perceptions and norms make it difficult um, to give and receive care, uh, respect and recognitions at times. And these were my final words. I'd like, you, I'd like to thank you all for listening. Uh, very much. And if you're interested in reading more about my work, uh, you can find um, my findings published here on the in these uh, publications on this slide. Thank you very much for for listening. <laughs>